So the 21st century, um, the wars where previously they were kind of fought around territory um, or direct threat to certain land or um, kind of very clearly identifiable conflict and, and a reason for war. Whereas 21st century conflicts um, are more based on ideological factors that are kind of quite hard to pin down. Um, the enemy's not always clear. Where the enemy is isn't always clear. Um, and the kind of these more recent conflicts, they've really spilled over into um, society, really. So where previous wars were confined to certain areas, um, that's no longer the case. So when you leave war, um, particularly like Afghanistan and Iraq, the war on terror isn't just in Afghanistan, it's not just in Iraq. Uh, you know, Facebook's fighting the war on terror. Um, so it's kind of leaving those conflicts is not the same as leaving other conflicts where there's an end or there's a cut-off. Um, and that really, I, th I think, is fundamentally different. The main aims of the project were to um, see how leaving 21st century conflict um, differs from leaving other conflicts. So veterans of current wars, um, particularly Afghanistan and Iraq, um, and how that differs from previous generations of, of veterans, really. Um, and I'm particularly interested in identity, um, in reintegration processes and transition, um, and really the complex nature of that, and particularly for those that we don't consider to be problematic. So for those that we kind of, um, that don't fit the constructions of veteran um, or a, a victim or offender. Um, and so to kind of unpick those on invisible voices, really, that's the aim of, of my project. My participants haven't necessarily been involved in the criminal justice system, or we don't know prior to interviewing them that they've been in the criminal justice system. Um, whereas a lot of other researchers focused on those that um, are criminal or have been criminal, um, or that are obviously victims, um, particularly around post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so my research really tries to kind of um, bring that into criminology where there's that aspect of um, we're not quite sure where this person fits as such. So they're not clearly identifiable in either kind of camp really of um, victim or offender. And so the insights that that can bring to criminology is um, the, those transition processes kind of unpacking the complex nature of that. What makes a successful transition or what makes um, the difference between somebody kind of becoming involved in the criminal justice system or not. So hopefully that kind of unpacking that um, will be part of my research really. Um, in terms of more um, widely in terms of military studies, again I think my research um, draws out the kind of um, cultural aspects of what it means to be um, ex-forces and how that for a successfully transitioned person, what that looks like, what Civvy Street looks like for that person, um, whether the kind of military can be a positive. Um, and I think that's often where we, um, as academics, we all, uh, criminologists, I should say, we, we look at um, often problematic uh, individuals, whereas actually there can be lots of positives that come from military service. And those transitions, um, unpacking that, um, I think is a really worthwhile thing for, for military studies and to kind of work out what's going on, um, especially around social networks and, and things like that and how people use support or not. Combat capital is a concept that I'm currently uh, developing. Um, it's probably important to just very briefly mention what I mean by capital. Um, so it's kind of two main features of capital. that The first is that it can be acquired, so it can be increased or decreased. Um, and the second is that it can be transferred um, or exchanged. Um, often we think about in terms of money, so for goods and services, um, or we can increase or decrease our bank balance. So combat capital um, is made up of a few things, uh, social, cultural and physical capital, as well as military experience, um, training, skills and knowledge. And when these things come together, um, they form a value. Um, and it depends on the context to which they're in as to how valuable or not this is. Um, a bit like a currency really, so it fluctuates um, depending on circumstances and the time in which it's used. Um, and the aim of combat capital really is to bring together the complex um, relationships and networks and bonds that form as part of military service. Um, and to kind of look at the benefits and pitfalls that that can create. Um, and also when we use it as a, think a thinking tool, um, it can be really useful in um, trying to understand the complex nature 
of returning from conflict. Um, and also, probably more importantly, to critically examine the way in which certain conflicts and leaving those conflicts can be more or less valuable um, for individuals and reintegration. My methodology um, involves um, in-depth interviews and also photo elicitation. Um, and the interviews are very um, informal, they're not very structured, and I try to, as much as possible, let them be led entirely by the participant. Um, one way I do this is to um, use, ask, well, I invite my participants to bring photos or items to the interview, um, and whatever they bring structures the interview, so I don't always know what I'll be talking about until I'm talking about it. Uh, which is really exciting from research terms. Um, and that was really driven personally by a desire to make sure that my research captures the voices of those that I'm interviewing. So I'm not just replicating what I think might be important or my ideas or questions that I think will get to a certain thing. Um, so it's really kind of letting um, the participant guide what we talk about. And so whatever they talk about, the idea is that is important to them. Um, and I think one lesson that can be learned for this research area um, is that using photos and items can be really beneficial with this group. So where often um, there's a reluctance to talk about yourself um, or a reluctance often to um, engage in certain di difficult discussions, when there's an item or a photo, you're talking about this thing. Um, and so it kind of removes um, the conversation away from you slightly, even though you are still talking about yourself and stories. Um, it's quite a useful tool to get um, access to kind of stories that you probably wouldn't have, have come across without um, those items. So I think it's important um, in the future that we um, continue to reimagine the veteran. I think it's really important. Um, veteran isn't a one-size-fits-all term. Um, there's a lot of um, military personnel that reject that, um, which is can be quite problematic in terms of support, um, getting support to those that, that need it most. Often um, the right people to help are branded as veteran, um, and when people reject those um, kind of... The, what comes along with that, so pride, honour, um, heroism, when people reject that, and um, that can be a barrier to help and support. So I think that's important. Um, I also think it's important, um, particularly within criminology, to remember that um, when we're looking at a veteran offender, there's um, a life before their military. Um, so we often can look, we end up kind of looking just through the lens of um, military when we look at people leaving prison, um, which, yes, that might be a factor in, in the life course and in, in their offending, but the, there is um, a life that went before the military. So I think it's important to remember that this is kind of, it's an important part of people's life, but it is a part of somebody's life. It's not their entire life. Um, so I think that's something to be aware of, I think, moving forward. Um, and also looking at the positives um, that military service can bring and to try and um, really be critical, I think, about the impact that um, we as a society have on that transition and how accepting or not we are of those um, characteristics, if you will, or culture, um, as well as being aware to, as researchers, um, particularly criminologists, to not let the violence become um, banal, to not let it become normal. So things that used to kind of shock me um, at the start of my research, now I, I, you know, I don't think about it. So I, that's just you know something that I've heard before. It's not shocking, um, and that in itself is quite shocking. That we very quickly, you know, even within a couple of months, become um, normalised to the violence. Really, so I think that's something that is very important that we remember that. Um, this is these are very unique um, kind of exposures to violence that aren't always. I mean, to us they're not normal, um, but to also to the the people that are doing it, they can be normal. So what's sometimes problematic is not the violence itself, but leaving that violence or leaving that conflict. And that's often um, some of my participants said that's that's the difficult thing. The war was easy. I knew what I was meant to do. Um, you know, that made sense, that was clear. Leaving that um, was what was difficult.